So back in the US where I work these days, people often ask me, what's your secret in Sweden? Why does Sweden have so many awesome companies? And when I stand here and I look out at you guys, I'm like, I get it. You are the reason. So it's, it, because you think big. And I've been invited to encourage you to think even bigger, like cosmically big. So let's take a big step back and reflect on the fact that after 13.8 billion years of cosmic history, the internet was invented. And uh, you were joking about people dismissing advanced AI as science fiction. Well, back when I was a kid, if someone started describing the internet, that would also be dismissed as science fiction. Yet it happened. So we want to think big. And if you take this more cosmic perspective, what's really happened is that after 13.8 billion years of cosmic history, our universe has woken up in the sense that small, conscious parts of our universe have begun gazing out into the, the cosmos with telescopes and discovered something humbling. We've discovered that, we're, that our cosmos is just vastly grander than our ancestors imagined, and uh, that life itself is an almost imperceptibly small perturbation on what looks pretty dead, you know, aside from Star Trek shows and stuff which really is science fiction. But we've also discovered something inspiring, which I want to spend the rest of this talk on, which is that the technology we're developing has the potential to help life flourish like never before. And not just for the next election cycle, which might be like really soon in Sweden, but for <laughs> billions of years. And not just on Earth, but throughout much of this amazing cosmos. Now this earliest life, I like to call 1.0, because it was really dumb like bacteria, unable to learn anything during its lifetime. I call us humans life 2.0, because we can learn, which we in nerdy geek speak might think of as installing new software into our brains, like languages and job skills. And it's this ability to design our, and change our own software which has enabled us to become the dominant life form on the planet and invent the internet and all the other things. Now, Life 3.0, which can design not only its software, but also its hardware, of course doesn't exist yet. But perhaps technology has already made us Life 2.1 with our artificial knees, pacemakers, and cochlear implants. So let's talk about our relationship with technology. The Apollo moon mission, raise your hand if you actually saw it on TV live. When it was, I'm jealous, that's awesome. It was both successful and inspiring, because it showed that when we humans use technology wisely, we can accomplish stuff that our ancestors could only dream of. But there's an even more inspiring journey, propelled by something more powerful than rocket engines, where the passengers aren't just three astronauts, but all of humanity. So let's talk about our collective journey into the future with artificial intelligence. My friend Jan Tallinn likes to point out that just as with rocketry, if we're going to be really ambitious with technology, it's not enough to make it powerful. We also have to figure out how to steer it and where we want to go with it. So I want to spend the rest of this talk on discussing all three for artificial intelligence. The power, the steering, and the destination. All right? I define intelligence very inclusively, simply as the ability to accomplish goals. And the more complex those goals are, the more intelligent. I'm this inclusive because I want to include both biological and artificial intelligence. And I want to avoid this silly carbon chauvinism idea that you can only be smart if you're made of meat. I want to avoid it because it's exactly the opposite of carbon chauvinism, which has given us the internet and given us the artificial intelligence revolution. Namely, this idea that intelligence is all about information processing. So it doesn't matter if the information is processed by carbon atoms in cells and brains or by silicon atoms in today's computers or some other kind of atoms in tomorrow's technology. And it's really amazing how this idea has grown the power of AI. Think about it. Not long ago, we didn't robots couldn't walk. Now they can do backflips.
not long ago, we didn't have self-driving cars. Now, we have self-flying rockets that can land themselves with artificial intelligence. Not long ago, AI couldn't do face recognition. Now, it can generate fake faces of people that never existed. And it can simulate your face you know, saying stuff that, that you never said. So be careful. <laughs> And not long ago, AI was mostly an academic exercise, and now it can save lives. Over a million people lost their lives on the world's roads last year, and most of those lives could have been saved <laughs> with self-driving cars that were on the cusp of developing. And uh, even more lives can be saved by simply eliminating mistakes that happen in hospitals with, re with relatively easy and low-tech AI. And that's just avoiding mistakes. If we can use AI to accelerate the progress of science, medical science, for example, we can create whole new types of medicine and treatment and diagnosis methods. We already today have AI systems that can provide better diagnosis or as good as human doctors for prostate cancer, lung cancer, and various eye diseases. And not long ago, AI could not beat us at the board game of Go. Raise your hand if you know the rules of this game. Okay, it's a lot harder than chess, right? But then Google out deep mind its Alpha Zero AI it took 3,000 years of human Go games and Go wisdom, ignored it all, and just by playing it against itself for 24 hours with no human input except the rules, became the world's best Go player. And the most impressive thing here is not that AlphaZero crushed human gamers, but that it crushed human AI researchers who had spent decades handcrafting game-playing software, which is now completely obsolete and useless. And the same AlphaZero crushed us not just at Go, but also at chess. It played after two hours against itself and could beat all the best humans, and after four hours of self-play, it could even crush, crush our best chess-playing software, Stockfish. Played 100 games, didn't lose a single one, and won a bunch of games, even as black. So all of this amazing pro recent progress obviously begs the question, how far will this go? We're here because we're excited about the future. So what's going to happen with AI? I like to think about this question in terms of this abstract landscape of tasks, where the elevation represents how hard it is for AI to do each task at human level, and the sea level represents what AI can do today. The sea level is obviously rising, so the key message, if you're telling your, giving your kids or yourself career advice, is to be, be careful with careers right at the waterfront, which are going to be soon disrupted by automation. But there's also a deeper question, which is how high will the water end up rising? Will it eventually submerge all land? matching human intelligence at all tasks. This is the definition of artificial general intelligence, AGI. And by this definition, the people who say, ah, there'll always be jobs that people can do better than machines, are simply saying, we will never get AGI. Now, if you think this sounds like crazy science fiction, it's important to, think, to be clear that there is something else which sounds like even more crazy science fiction. And that's super intelligence. The idea is very simple. It's that if we actually build AGI at some point, then since machines can, by definition, do all jobs better than us, that includes the job of AI development, which means that further AI development can now happen on a much shorter time scale than the typical human research and development time scale of years. And it raises this very controversial possibility that uh, recursively self-improving AI will rapidly leave human intelligence far behind in the dust, creating superintelligence. Now, we have to pause, because here in Sweden we have to have both feet on the ground and do a little reality check. Is this actually just some kind of crazy talk which is only taken seriously by philosophers who don't know anything about AI? Some people say that, but I'm going to let you guys decide for yourselves by listening in on a little panel. I moderated it at this conference in California last year.
All of these nine people philosophers. Well, my friend and colleague Nick Bostrom is a philosopher, and so is David Chalmers, but none of the others. And uh, Demis Sasabis is the leader of Google DeepMind that gave us AlphaZero. Jan Tallinn gave you Skype. Elon Musk, certainly not just a philosopher. And we have some really famous AI professors here. Stuart Russell wrote the most popular textbook on AI. So it's obviously not true to just <laughs> dismiss this as just crazy philosopher's talk. We have to take seriously that superintelligence actually might happen because very serious people in AI think so. But that doesn't mean that it will happen. And it certainly doesn't mean it will happen anytime soon or even that, or that AGI will happen anytime soon. So, so what should we expect? Well, this is a real interesting and fun scientific controversy. On one hand, you have people like my MIT colleague Rodney Brooks, who's like, nah, won't happen for hundreds of years. Or Andrew Eng, who used to work for Baidu, who's like, this is so far off, it's like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. On the other hand, you have people like Google DeepMind's Demis Asabis, who think it's going to happen much sooner and is focusing his entire company on trying to make it happen. And recent surveys have shown that most AI researchers actually share Demis's forecast, his optimistic vision that this will happen relatively soon. Well, it's optimistic or pessimistic, depending on what, what you think the outcome will be. And this really begs the question, well, if we get artificial general intelligence within decades, so within the lifetime of most of you, then what? What will the role of humans be if machines can do everything better and cheaper than us? The way I see it, we face a choice. It's the most important choice of our time. One option is to be complacent. It can be like, ah, let's just build machines that can do everything better than us, not worry about the consequences. After all, if we build machines that can do everything cheaper and better than us, you know, what could possibly go wrong? On the other hand, that would be embarrassing and lame, I think. I think we should be ambitious. We are here because we're ambitious, right? And let's be ambitious, I say, and envision a truly inspiring high-tech future instead and figure out how to steer toward it. That brings us to the second part of our rocket metaphor, the steering. We're making AI more powerful, but how can we steer towards a future where it really helps humanity flourish rather than flounder? To help with this, I co-founded the Future of Life Institute that you heard about in the introduction, whose goal is simply for life, the future of life to exist and, and be as inspiring as possible. And um, I love technology. And I'm quite optimistic that we can create an inspiring high-tech future. If, and this is the catch, if we win the wisdom race, the race between the growing power of the technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage our technology and steer. And the problem is we can only win this wisdom race if we change strategies. Because our, our old strategy of staying ahead of the, in this race has always been to learn from mistakes. First we invented fire and screwed up a bunch of times. Then we invented the fire extinguisher. First we invented the car screwed up a bunch of times, and then we invented the seat belt and the airbag and the traffic light and laws against driving too fast. But science keeps progressing, which makes technology ever more powerful. And at some point, technology crosses a threshold where learning from mistakes goes from being a good idea to being a really bad idea. For example, I think if we have an accidental nuclear war in half an hour between the US and Russia and we get a hydrogen bomb dropped on Stockholm and then a few, a few thousand mushroom clouds later, we're like, ha, ah, that was a little clumsy. You know, Maybe we should learn from this mistake and just be a little more careful next time. Not quite the optimal strategy. And if we ever go ahead and build something as powerful as AGI, I think we clearly don't want to learn from mistakes and instead be proactive rather than reactive. Plan ahead and just get things right the first time, which might be the only time we have. I see a lot of you nodding. <laughs> Maybe you find this obvious, but it's funny because sometimes people tell me, shh, Max, don't talk like that. That's Luddite scaremongering. 
Skrämselpropaganda. But it's not skrämselpropaganda. It's what we at MIT call safety engineering. Think about it. Before NASA launched the Apollo moon mission, they systematically thought through everything that could go wrong when you put people on top of explosive fuel tanks and launched them into a place where no one could help them. And there was a lot that could go wrong. Was that scaremongering? No, that was exactly the safety engineering that ensured the success of the mission, and that is exactly the strategy that I am trying to persuade you that we should use if we ever decide to build AGI. Think through everything that can go wrong to make sure it goes right. So in this spirit, we have organized conferences bringing together leading AI researchers and other thinkers to discuss how to develop this wisdom that we need to keep AI beneficial. And the last conference we had in California last year in Asilomar produced this list of 23 principles that have since been signed by over a thousand AI researchers and also recently was endorsed by the government of the state of California. And I want to tell you about just three of them. One is that we should avoid an arms race and lethal autonomous weapons, also known as killer robots. And the idea here is very simple. Any science can be used for new ways of helping people or new ways of harming people. Right? Biology and chemistry are much more likely to be used for new cures and new materials than new ways of killing people because biologists and chemists persuaded the politicians of the world to stigmatize and ban biological and chemical weapons. And that's why today, if you have a friend doing something in biotech, they're probably making new medicines not bioweapons. And AI researchers simply want AI to be remembered the same way, by and large, as a source of new solutions, not as a source of little slaughter bots or other horrible weapons for enabling cheap and anonymous assassination. And I'm actually very happy that it's not just AI researchers who very much support banning these Thomas weapons, but a growing list of countries including China, have said that they want to ban. I'm quite embarrassed, being Swedish, that Sweden is not on this list. And when, when Anders Hultqvist, our defense minister, was asked by a report recently about this, he had one of his assistants reply, well, it's sort of a complicated issue on one hand. On the other hand, you know, maybe we should tillsätt an utredning. <laughs> Tell your politicians that Sweden should get on the right side of history and leave, be a leader, not a follower here. Another, another Asilomar principle is that we should avoid AI, we should mitigate AI fueled income inequality. If we can dramatic, I think if we can dramatically grow the overall economic pie by having machines produce ever more goods and services and make everything more efficient, and we still can't figure out how to share this growing wealth in such a way that everybody gets better off, then shame on us. And I really hope Sweden can be a country that leads the way here, because we have a much stronger tradition here in Sweden than in the US, for example, of really rallying and agreeing on this vision that society should help everybody, not just some. Now, raise your hand if your computer has ever crashed. <laughs> Ooh, that's a lot of hands. Well, then you'll appreciate this Asilomar principle, that we need to invest much more in uh, AI safety research. Because as we put AI in charge of ever more decisions and infrastructure, we have to figure out how to transform today's buggy and hackable computers into robust AI systems that we can really trust. Otherwise, all this awesome new technology we build can malfunction and harm us or get hacked and be turned against us. And this AI safety research is actually what I spend my time on during the day at MIT when I work with my research group on doing things in AI. I'm not going to bore you to death with a bunch of nerdy stuff, but we, we work on taking neural networks we've trained to do things that seem smart, this is an example from DeepMind that we just replicated. And then instead of just settling at this point and saying, now we understand how this works, the explanation is some list of almost of 857,000 numbers. Uh, crystal clear now how this works? Do you trust it to driving your car, flying your airplane? Me neither. And then we work on trying to see if we can transform this into something which is equally smart 
as an AI system, but where we can actually understand it and therefore get more trust. I'm going to skip over all the boring details here. It's very nerdy. It's good if, you're, if you suffer from insomnia because you're here jet lagged or something. Um, but it's just an example of the fact that the AI safety research is not about sitting around and worrying about the future. It's about actually doing concrete research, not to make AI more powerful, but to make it more trustworthy or in other ways more likely to be good. And this kind of AI safety research has to also include work on value alignment. What's that? Value alignment. Well, the real threat from AGI and superintelligence is not that it's going to turn evil, like in silly Hollywood movies, but that it's going to turn competent, really competent, and go out and accomplish goals that just are not aligned with our goals. Think about it. When we humans drove these guys, the West African black rhino, extinct, why did we do it? Not because we were evil rhinoceros haters, but because we were competent. We were more intelligent than them, and our goals were not aligned with theirs, and tough luck for them. AGI is by definition smarter than us, so to make sure we don't put all of humanity in the role of those, dino, those rhinos, if we build AGI, we have to figure out how to make machines understand our goals, adopt our goals, and retain our goals as, as they get smarter. And what goals should those be anyway? That brings us to the third and final part of our rocket metaphor, the destination. We're making AI more powerful, we're trying to figure out this, how to steer it with AI safety research, but what kind of society are we hoping to create if we succeed? This is the elephant in the room that almost nobody is talking about still today, because we're so fixated on the short-term AI stuff, like jobs and weapons. But what are we hoping to get if we succeed in, with AGI? We did a survey recently with about 15,000 people, and most of them actually wanted us to build superintelligence. Almost all of them wanted us to be really ambitious and one day even use it to help life spread into the cosmos. But there was much less agreement about who or what should be in control. And uh, <laughs> I was a little bit disturbed that there was even about 10% who wanted to be just machines. <laughs> Maybe they had recently been disappointed, disappointed, badly disappointed by some human <laughs> in their life. And there was total disagreement about what the role of humans should be, even at the most basic level. So let's take a quick look here at the end at possible futures that we might cho choose to steer toward. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about space travel here, just about our metaphorical journey into the future, okay? I have some colleagues who want us to build superintelligence and keep it under human control, like an enslaved god, disconnected from the internet and, and used to create unimaginable power and wealth for whoever controls it. But, you know, Lord Acton warned that power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. So you might worry that maybe we humans just aren't wise enough to handle this much power. And also, whatever moral qualms you might have about enslaving a superior mind, you might worry that this superintelligence might outsmart us and break out and take over. But I also have colleagues who are fine with AI breaking out and taking over and even causing human extinction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really said that. Uh, as long as, they, these colleagues say, as long as we can think of those AIs as our worthy descendants, like our children. But how would we know that these AIs have actually adopted our best values and aren't just some kind of unconscious zombies that are tricking us? into anthropomorphizing them. And also, if you believe in democracy, then shouldn't those people who don't want human extinction have a say in the matter too? And not just let this be decided by some tech nerds who haven't even been elected? So how about having, if you didn't like either of those two uh, high-tech scenarios, how, it's important to remember though that low-tech is actually just suicide in the cosmic perspective. Because if we don't go far beyond today's technology, the question is not whether humanity will go extinct in the future, but merely whether it will get wiped out by the next killer asteroid and the dinosaur killing class or some other problem that better technology could easily have solved. So how about having our cake and eating it with AI that's not enslaved but treats us well because its values are aligned with ours. This is the idea of friendly AI. And if we could pull this off, 
it could be awesome. It could not only eliminate negative experiences like disease, poverty, crime, and suffering, but it could also enable a, a really fascinating diversity of new positive experiences, really truly making us the masters of our own destiny. So our situation with technology as we move forward towards AGI and perhaps superintelligence is complicated, but the big picture I want to leave you with is actually very simple. Most AI researchers expect us to actually get AGI within decades, and if we just bumble into this with our eyes closed, with no planning whatsoever, and basically just taking as a, our new religion this uh, the technology, this idea that all technology is automatically beneficial, and we just keep repeating this to ourselves, as a, like a religious chant over and over again, all technology will automatically be beneficial, yes, 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 amen. Um, then I think it's probably going to be the biggest mistake in human history, let's face it. It could easily en enable a brutal global dictatorship with unprecedented surveillance and suffering and inequality and even human extinction. Not for reasons like in silly Hollywood movies, but simply because the technology is just so powerful that there are many kinds of mistakes that could be just one too many. But if we instead think hard about what kind of future really inspires us and think hard about how we can learn to steer our technology to take us in that direction, then I think we can look forward to an absolutely amazing future where the poor are richer, the rich are richer, Sweden is richer, China is richer, America is richer, everybody's better off, both on Earth and maybe one day even elsewhere in the, in the cosmos. And uh, we're all here to, at Internet Dogana because we're excited about technology and what kind of awesome future we can build with it. And I really want to leave you with my view, which is that the essence of this future should be that we should build AI not that overpowers us, but that empowers us. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely talk, Max. It was truly inspiring and, and causes so many questions to arise. And um, I'm sure the audience also has a bunch of them to ask. Unfortunately, we will only have time for one. And I was <laughs> thinking um, that I would ask you a little bit about this uh, concept that you use, um, namely mindful optimism. Ah. Uh, you uh, suggest that we, that we can and should be optimistic about the future that we just heard, as long as we plan and work for it, right? So um, how can we do this? How can we, instead of being afraid of a coming Terminator or HAL that yeah. will take over, how can we change our mindsets to be a bit more mindfully optimistic? It's a great question. I, I often get students coming into my office at MIT for career advice, and I always ask them, where do you want to be in the future? You know, and if all she can say is, oh, maybe I'll have cancer, maybe I'll get have been murdered, you know, a terrible strategy for career planning. It's just going to make you a hypochondriac paranoid, right? And yet, every time we go to the movies, what do we do as the human species? We watch Blade Runner or Terminator or one dystopia after another, right? Which makes us very pessimistic. And, um, we should not be naive optimists and just say, yeah, everything is automatically going to be fine. What we should do instead is really think hard about what kind of future we are excited about and, uh, and then think about how we can get there. You know, I think Sweden can kind of lead the way here. We already did this once in 1945. You know, people in Sweden did not just sit around and say, if we just sit here on our butts and do nothing, then we're going to get free health care and free university education and this welfare state. No, they ha people had this really positive vision and they thought very creatively about how they could combine this idealism with practical planning and technology and actually go out and build it. So I would like, to, as homework, professors are terrible, they always <laughs> give homework, right? To all of you is, next time you're just having beers or coffee with someone, right? Instead of just talking about things that could go wrong or what you're worried about, Ask them what kind of future in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years with very advanced AI they would be really excited about. And see if, the, if you can 
agree on something that you're both really excited about and start spreading these memes. Because if we can all start the shaping a really shared, powerful, positive vision like Sweden did, we did here in, after, in the late 40s, right? the, clear, the more we know what we want, and the, the more we are going to be willing to do the work to get there, and the more likely we are to actually get there. Thank you. Let's build yeah. a shared imaginary yeah. then for the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we got you a, um, a, a programmable droid, so you can decide whether the, this is going to be a slaughter bot or a slightly more positive <laughs> robot. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.